Um, yeah, so like Tristato just said, um, I'm going to be presenting today on the epidemiological interactions between influenza and respiratory syncytial viruses and their implications for epidemic control. All right, so I want to start with just discussing a little bit what we mean when we say a pathogen-pathogen interaction. So this figure is from a recent paper from our lab, or maybe not quite as recent anymore, um, but the figure was made by Laura, who's one of our PhD students. Um, and when we say that there is an interaction between two or more pathogens, we mean that being infected with one pathogen is going to alter your susceptibility to, or the transmissibility of, or the severity of an infection with another pathogen. And there are several important features that we care about when we're talking about interactions, which makes them very complex to characterize. So the first thing we care about, let me try this. Um, all right, there we go. Um, the sign and the strength of our interaction. So by the sign, we mean if it's a positive interaction, that means that being infected with pathogen A is going to make you more likely to become infected with pathogen B, or it's going to make pathogen B more severe when you get it, et cetera. Whereas a negative interaction is the opposite. It means when you're infected with pathogen A, you're going to be less likely then to get pathogen B. The strength is just what it sounds like, the extent to which um, infection with pathogen A is enhancing or reducing your susceptibility or severity to pathogen B. We are also interested in the duration of this um, interaction. So how long after you're infected with pathogen A is your susceptibility, for example, to pathogen B still enhanced or reduced? Does this last for a week? Does it last for two months? Um, that's also going to be an important feature of this inter interaction. We also care about the symmetry of the interaction. And what we mean by that is if the interaction is symmetric, we mean that the effect of pathogen A on pathogen B is the same as the effect of pathogen B on pathogen A. Whereas if it's asymmetric, then the effects are going to differ depending on which pathogen you encounter first. There are several potential mechanisms for these interactions at the individual level, for example, modulation of the immune response, um, changing microbiota. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in the context of this project's results. But a really key point here is that even though these interactions are occurring on the level of the individual, they can sometimes have pronounced population level impacts. And when this happens, we may end up seeing unintended and sometimes unanticipated effects of public, of public health policies. So it's really important to understand these interactions so that we can better understand and then anticipate what these outcomes are going to be. So an example I wanted to walk through was the example of vaccination. So let's, let's um, look at a vaccination against pathogen A. Of course, if we use that vaccination, we're going to hopefully see reduced rates of pathogen A. Now, if there is a positive interaction between pathogens A and B, then that's even better. Having um, reduced rates of pathogen A in the population means that there's also going to be reduced rates of pathogen B because getting pathogen A is increasing your susceptibility to pathogen B. However, if there's a negative interaction, and getting pathogen A actually protects you against pathogen B, then we might expect that vaccinating against that first pathogen is actually going to lead to larger outbreaks of pathogen B, which is something we need to be aware of um, when we start using these vaccines widely. The situation becomes even more complex in the case of a live vaccine, and this is because, um, let's consider just a negative interaction here. Okay, so we're, if we vaccinate against pathogen A with a live vaccine, we expect reduced rates of pathogen A, um, assuming that this live since this live vaccine includes live pathogen A, we might be able to expect that it would have a similar impact on pathogen B as actual infection with pathogen um, A, which is to say that we might actually expect reduced rates of pathogen B to occur if you get this vaccine. However, in the population at large, since there will be, again, reduced rates of pathogen A, we might actually expect there to be less protection against pathogen B, which is to say a higher burden of pathogen B. So these are conflicting effects of this same vaccine, and it's difficult to say um, just by sort of looking at the situation in the population, which of these effects is going to dominate and in which context. So you can see that um, sometimes the effects that these interactions might have at the population level aren't necessarily intuitive if we're simply looking at it. We might need um, more complex tools to try to tease out what these effects are going to be. Today, as I said, I'm going to be focusing on influenza and RSV. I think probably everyone's pretty familiar with influenza. This is a respiratory virus that leads to both yearly outbreaks as well as occasional pandemics. 
Um, ordinarily, I would say that respiratory syncytial virus or RSV is kind of less well known, but I think since COVID, it has been in the news quite a bit. This is um, another respiratory pathogen, another respiratory virus, this time um, one that's particularly notable in very young children. It's a very common cause of respiratory hospitalizations and pneumonia in infants and children under five. Less is known about infections in adults. Um, we think they probably tend to be mostly asymptomatic or very mild, but there's no reason to believe that adults aren't at least contributing to the transmission of this virus. And importantly, these viruses have a lot of things in common. They're both respiratory infections. They both cause yearly outbreaks during the winter months, at least in temperate regions. And they both tend to cause the most severe disease in the same age groups, which is to say very young children and the elderly. And some past evidence has suggested that there is indeed a negative interaction between these two viruses. So what you're seeing here is a figure from a study, an experimental study in ferrets. Um, the red bars are showing um, um, shedding of RSV and the blue ones are showing shedding of influenza. And what you can see is that when the ferrets were infected with influenza, either it's a bit difficult to aim, sorry, um, three days or seven days, I guess I'm supposed to be aiming at this, um, three days or seven days before they were infected with RSV. Um, it was very difficult to impossible to infect them with RSV and the timing, the peak timing of the shedding was delayed, but um, the effect did go away by day 11 though. The same was not observed when the affer ferrets were infected with RSV first, suggesting that this may be an asymptomatic um, asymmetric intera interaction where the effect of flu on RSV is there, but maybe there's not so much an effect of RSV on flu. And this actually goes together really nicely with an observation we saw in human populations during the 2009 influenza pandemic. So during this pandemic, influenza was circulating a lot earlier than it normally was. And what we observed is that RSV outbreaks were delayed by several weeks in many countries, um, in particular in the Northern Hemisphere where the pandemic was circulating right at the beginning of the normal RSV season. So the colors of these points here show the extent to which um, the first RSV outbreak after the pandemic occurred later than RSV outbreaks that occurred either before or after the pandemic. And I wanna highlight that a negative interaction is only one possible explanation for this. These are purely observational data. Um, just because the negative interaction is consistent with what we see here doesn't mean it's actually responsible for it. It's also quite possible that, for example, you know, there was a pandemic going on. It's possible people were much more careful, in particular, with where they took their babies and their very young children, and that's why the RSV outbreaks were delayed so much. Um, I also want to note that um, I've showed just some of the evidence here. The evidence is far from conclusive. For example, there are a lot of studies that suggest that co-infections of flu and RSV are less severe than infections with either virus, which would suggest a negative interaction. But there are also plenty of studies that suggest that co-infections are more severe. So really the jury is very much still out on this question. So the first objective of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is to try to infer the strength and the duration of the interaction between influenza and RSV using population level outbreak data in conjunction with the mathematical model of influenza and RSV transmission. Based on those results, then, we also want to explore what the impact of live attenuated influenza vaccines might be on RSV burden. So remember, if there's a negative interaction, we may expect that getting this vaccine could also protect you against RSV, but by reducing the rates of influenza in the population, it may also increase susceptibility to RSV in the population. And we want to understand when each of those effects may tend to dominate. What I want to do is go through the methods, results, conclusions, sort of everything for this first objective, and then move into the second. Before I get into that, though, I do want to um, stop really briefly to motivate our use of mathematical modeling approaches here. So infectious disease transmission dynamics are very complex. They're very nonlinear. Um, and in, this, in these situations, unintuitive behavior can emerge at the population scale, which means that sometimes standard epidemiological methods, which are, tend to be observational, can fail. <clears throat> so, for example, one way that's been suggested of determining whether there is a negative or a positive interaction between two pathogens is to look at the phase difference, to look at the extent to which outbreaks of the two pathogens occur at the same time. And what we might expect intuitively is that this figure on the left looks like a negative interaction because these outbreaks are occurring at different times. And this figure on the right looks like a positive interaction. The um, outbreaks are occurring very much at the same time um, in all years. But the reality is that both of these figures were generated from a model using the same exact parameters, and they both had a very strong negative interaction. 
and the authors of this simulation study um, over here had found that um, while yes, it was more likely that a negative interaction would produce what you see on the left, it certainly was not um, universal. And they really found no way of actually just looking at the patterns of the outbreak transmission and saying anything conclusive about the type of interaction that was at play. Um, another study from our own group looked at another um, typical study design, which is to look at the rates of co-infections in the population and see are they less than or more than statistically expected um, and try to figure out if there's an interaction that way. But indeed what we found was that um, this method tended to underestimate the strength of interactions and sometimes even got the direction wrong. So there would be a negative interaction, but we would find it to be positive based on this um, method. Um, so unlike these epidemiological methods, mathematical models are able to explicitly account for both the underlying transmission dynamics of the two pathogens, and they can also account for the exact mechanism um, of the interaction itself. <clears throat> Sorry. And we'll discuss that more when we get to the specific model that I've been using for this work. Um, another benefit of models is that they can be used to generate counterfactuals. So we can really easily look at them, use them to understand what may happen if we, for example, use different public health control measures. And for these reasons, we believe mathematical modeling, a mathematical modeling approach is a really um, attractive approach to these questions. Okay, so now I want to move into objective one, which is to infer the strength and duration of this interaction. So we need sort of three components to do this. We need data on influenza and RSV transmission. We need a model of influenza and RSV transmission, and we need some sort of method to take those two and bring them together. So we'll start with the data. Here we have six seasons of data from Hong Kong. Um, we have two types of data, both of which are taken into account by our model. The first is virological data. So this is the percent of tests that are positive for either influenza, and here we've combined H1N1 and B influenza in red, and RSV in blue. Um, even though Hong Kong has a subtropical climate, um, for H1N1 and B at least, we see a very... Um, once a year seasonal pattern that's more characteristic of the temperate regions. It's also much easier to model. For this reason, we have decided to leave H3N2 out for now. Um, H3N2 sometimes had multiple peaks in a year, which is much, much more complicated to model. Although I'll talk later about a couple of sensitivity analyses we did to try to account for it at least a little bit. So overall, what we see is that the flu outbreaks tend to occur early in the year. Um, there tends to be at least, there tends to be one outbreak a year, at least for these subtypes. RSV is a little less regular. Um, there tend to be a single outbreak early in the year, but um, for example, if you look at 2017, the outbreak's a bit later than usual. In some years, there tends to be sort of circulation throughout the year with no clear peak. It's a bit noisier than the um, influenza data. We also see that influenza does consistently peak at least a little bit before RSV, although there's still a very good amount of overlap in the circulation of both viruses. The other type of data we included is syndromic data. So these are inf influenza-like illness cases per 1,000 consultations at outpatient clinics. This is a symptom-based measure. So for example, if you go to the doctor with, um, for example, a fever and a cough, they might diagnose you with influenza-like illness. It doesn't necessarily indicate that you have flu or RSV, just that you have symptoms consistent with one of these things. Um, what you can see is that the timing of these peaks um, in the second plot mostly sort of at least tend to correspond with the timing of the peaks in the first plot. Um, they're a bit noisier, but that's to be expected since they're, again, less specific. <clears throat> Moving on to our model then, our model takes infections with um, both pathogens explicitly into account. So in our model, you can become infected with influenza that's shown in red. So you start out being susceptible, you can become infected, and then you can recover. Um, you can do the same with RSV, so that's shown in blue. You start out susceptible, become infected, can become recovered, or you can encounter both viruses at the same time, which is shown here in purple. Those are co-infections. And how we model the interaction in this model is if you were either, and let's see, if you were either fully susceptible to influenza or if you are fully immune to influenza and you encounter RSV, you're going to get infected at some standard rates. But if you were either currently infected with influenza or if you have recently been infected with influenza, you are going to get RSV if you encounter it at a reduced rate, and that's what this theta is here. We also care about how long this interaction lasts, like I said, so that's this delta, that's the rate at which you leave this 
temporary post-infection um, period of reduced susceptibility. So that's for um, influence on RSV. Of course, we also want to model um, the effect of RSV on influenza. So again, if you are currently or have recently infected with recently been infected with RSV, we're going to allow you to have a smaller um, rate of essentially catching influenza if you encounter it. Although, like I said, um, there's less research on this direction, but so far the evidence suggests that maybe there isn't necessarily an interaction in this direction. So moving on to model fitting, what we want to do is we want to fit the model to both virus, to date on both viruses simultaneously. Um, some infections have very regular seasonal cycles and you can just sort of fit um, the entire data stream all at once. That's a little more difficult to do with something like influenza that tends to have very different size peaks and somewhat different timing year to year. So what we've done is split the data into individual seasons for fitting. However, we also want to make sure that we're taking as much information into account when fitting these models as possible. So what we've done to try to balance these two things is we split our parameters into season specific parameters, which as the name suggests, are allowed to vary from season to season, and shared parameters, which we constrain to take the same values for all seasons. So our season-specific parameters are things like the R-effective, which dictates how transmissible the virus is that year, and the initial conditions. So the, for example, the percent of people who are immune to both viruses at the beginning of the season. Whereas our shared parameters are things like our strength and duration of interaction, and then also things like reporting rates and the strength of climate forcing. Now, this does lead to us having a lot of parameters to fit, which means that this becomes a really compu computationally intense um, problem. What we try to do to help make this as efficient as possible is we split our fitting procedure into three key steps. First, we actually start by fitting the model to each individual season alone. And then this, in this step, we actually hold the strength and duration of interaction and most of our shared parameters sort of constant at the null. And this is just done to get good initial values for these season specific parameters. Once we have those, we can then use those values as our starting values for our next fitting step, which is to fit the model to all seasons simultaneously, this time allowing the shared parameters to be fit to. And we actually can repeat this step multiple times until we are consistently getting back um, several model fits that are of pretty similar quality, um, which suggests us that we are indeed reaching the maximum likelihood estimate. <clears throat> And then finally, we obtain our 95% confidence intervals using parametric bootstrapping, which basically means that we are um, simulating several synthetic outbreaks at the maximum likelihood estimate, fitting the model and fitting the model to those um, synthetic data sets and using the results to form our 95% confidence intervals. All of the fitting is done using maximum likelihood methods, like I said, specifically trajectory matching, which is searching for parameters such that the simulated trajectory is as close as possible to the trajectory we see in our observed data. Moving on to our results, um, I'm first going to show the results for the effect of flu on RSV. So just to refresh your memory a bit, the theta lambda 1 is going to be this reduction in susceptibility when one is infected with or has recently been infected with influenza, and the inverse of delta. So delta is the rate at which one leaves this temporary um, post-infection reduced susceptibility state. So its inverse is the duration of time that someone spends in that state. What we find here is that the reduction um, parameter or the strength parameter is essentially zero. And even the 95% confidence interval, um, even the, the top of that is quite close to zero, which suggests that infection with influenza is almost entirely blocking infection with RSV in this population. This is pretty consistent with what we expected based on experimental results. As if you recall the um, study in ferrets I showed earlier, um, we sort of saw the same thing. The ferrets were very, very difficult to infect with RSV if they had very recently been infected with influenza. Now, the duration we found here is a bit more surprising. We found a duration of about three months for this effect, whereas in the ferrets, as I said earlier, this was about 10 or 11 days. Um, I think it's difficult to translate what 10 or 11 days in a ferret means for a human. Um, nonetheless, I, think, I do think it's fair to say this is longer than what we expected to find. That does not necessarily mean that it's implausible, and I will talk about that a bit more um, in a few slides. <clears throat> um, for results on the other direction, so the effect of RSV on flu, we found a similar magnitude in the reduction of susceptibility. Um, 
the 95% confidence interval is a bit wider, but it still mostly suggests that infection with RSV is almost entirely preventing infection with influenza. However, the duration we found here was a bit shorter. It was only about one month instead of three months. These results were a bit less expected. Like I said, um, past research hasn't really shown RSV being able to block transmission of influenza. That said, the bulk of the past research, and there's not much research in either direction, but the bulk of what exists is looking at flu on RSV and not RSV on flu. So I would say also this um, suggests that maybe more experimental research should be done looking at the opposite direction as well. To help double check that our um, fitting procedure was actually reaching the maximum likelihood estimate, we also looked at profile likelihoods for our interaction strength parameters. So this is done by holding the values of these parameters at a ra the range of values on the x-axis, fitting the model for each of those, and then showing how the log likelihood changes um, at each of those values. What we see here is that the profile likelihoods are peaking around zero, which is the um, value that we fit for these parameters, which helps um, helps us feel a bit more comfortable that we actually have reached the maximum likelihood estimates for this analysis. Um, so those are the results on the individual level of the interaction. So what's happening in an individual who gets infected with flu or RSV and encounters the other? We also care about what happens, though, at the population level. Um, <clears throat> so how we assessed this was we simulated epidemics at the maximum likelihood estimate. First, um, allowing the interaction to operate according to the um, parameter estimates that we found in the, pre in the previous few slides. And then we also simulated the epidemics um, leaving that interaction out. So saying there is no interaction between these two pathogens. What we see here is um, the black dotted line is influenza incident, is influenza, is the influenza outbreak in each of these seasons. The dark blue shows um, RSV in the presence of the interaction, and the light blue shows what we expect to see, what we expect the RSV outbreaks would look like if there was no interaction with influenza. So overall, what we found was that on average, we expect we would predict in this population that RSV outbreaks would be um, on average 27% larger if not for this interaction effect. Although, as you can see, this effect does vary quite a bit by season, depending on what the underlying transmission dynamics are. So for 2014-15 and 2016-17, where there's actually very little um, transmission of influenza, then of course we don't really see much effect of the interaction between influenza and RSV. Um, of course, we wanted to look at the opposite direction as well. So this time the dotted line is RSV, whereas the dark red is influenza in the presence of the interaction. The light red is in what the influenza outbreaks would look like if there weren't an interaction in effect. We actually found a very similar um, effect at the population level, despite the shorter lived interaction in this direction. We found that we predicted that influenza outbreaks would be on average 26% smaller or 26% larger, sorry, if there was no interaction between flu and RSV. So overall, our results are supporting um, the idea that not only is this interaction potentially important for the individual, it can also have quite um, substantial effects at the population level, at least in this population. I want to note that, um, you know, you can imagine that in a population where RSV is consistently peaking 10 weeks before influenza, maybe the interaction effect of influenza on RSV actually doesn't have an impact at the population level because by the time influenza starts circulating, the RSV outbreak is almost over. So this is um, the, in the individual level results I showed, I think are probably going to be pretty consistent from population to population because they're sort of um, based in biology. These population level impacts are going to depend on what the circulation patterns of both viruses look like in an individual season and an individual population. We also wanted to look at how well our model fits our data. So what you're seeing here is on the x-axis, you're seeing um, the number of cases that we simulated at the maximum likelihood estimates. On the y-axis, you're seeing the actual observed number of cases in our data. What you can see is that for influenza, agreement was very high. We found an overall R squared of 0.9. For RSV, the agreement um, I think still looks good. It's um, a little bit, it's it's a bit less than influenza being around 0.52. And this is likely just because, as you saw in the data earlier, the RSV data are a lot noisier, which makes them a bit more difficult to fit with um, the types of models that we're using here. 
Overall, though, this indicates that broadly our model is capable of um, reproducing the patterns that we see in the data, which is um, really encouraging to see here because we only have six seasons of data and we're fitting a model with 54 parameters. So despite these things, we're able to fit the model pretty closely to the data. We're able to get fairly precise estimates of our um, parameters of interest. And all of this um, goes to support sort of our initial ex expectation that mathematical models seem to be a pretty useful tool for studying pathogen-pathogen interactions. <clears throat> okay, I wanna talk about a few sensitivity analyses we did, now. We did um, here. Like I said, we decided to ignore AH3N2 influenza for now, because as you can see, there were often multiple peaks per year, which is difficult to model with the simple models we used. Um, H3N2 is in dark blue here. However, we would, of course, expect that if flu is going to reduce the transmissi transmissibility of RSV, we could be getting biased estimates if we're not taking this into account. So a couple of things that we did to try to account for this, at least partially, were first of all, we allowed for H3N2 incidents to modulate RSV transmission in the model. This was done with a single parameter. It wasn't fully modeled the way that we fully modeled H1N1 and B and RSV, which means that unfortunately we were only able to consider sort of um, an interaction in the current week and not one that lasted several months. A very short, so we were only able to consider a very short-lived interaction, but. Um, we're hoping it's better than nothing, and at least um, at least starts to show whether um, whether this is a major issue or whether this is something that maybe we can try to work towards in um, in future work, including this more fully. <clears throat> the other thing we tried was to fit only the last two seasons of the data, which, as you can see, have um, very little circulation of H three. Um, under the assumption that um, if we can get similar model fits in seasons where H3N2 is not circulating, then that suggests that H3N2 actually wasn't terribly important in biasing our results. And what we found broadly was that the results we found from both of these sensitivity analyses did yield um, parameter estimates that were very similar to what we saw in our main analysis. For the second analysis in particular, the duration of the effect on RSV on flu was fit longer. It was fit to be about three months instead of one, so more similar to the um, effect of flu on RSV. But at the same time, you know, here we were only fitting the model to two seasons of data, which does make it a bit more uncertain. Overall, um, I think it's encouraging that we saw most of the parameters be fairly similar to what we saw in our main analysis. Another sensitivity analysis we did, and this was based on a comment that we get a lot, especially from epidemiologists working with RSV, is concern that our model is not age structured. So influenza tends to circulate mostly in school age children, while RSV is mostly seen in very young children. And so if the contact rates in a population are very age dependent, which they usually are, we might expect that <clears throat> our model, which considers homogeneous mixing, doesn't consider age structure, is either overestimating or underestimating the actual amount of overlap that these two pathogens are going to see in a population. And this in turn could also bias our estimates of the interaction parameters. That said, incorporating age structure in our model would be very difficult. As you've seen, we have tried to fit um, the proportions infected and immune to both viruses at the beginning of each season. Um, if we had to do that then for five age groups each season, that would make the number of parameters we were trying to fit enormous, and it would be really, really difficult, potentially even impossible to accomplish this. So as a proof of concept to see, to help test whether our homogeneously mixed model could actually accurately fit data from an age structured population, <clears throat> We first generated synthetic data using an age structured model. So we used the parameters that we had estimated at the maximum likelihood estimate in conjunction with an age structured model to generate data. And then we fit our model, which again, doesn't um, consider age structure to these data to see if we could, um, to see if we could accurately fit the parameter values. And um, the key thing here is because we generated the data, we know what the true parameter values are. So we know how well our model is doing in this second step. And what we found, again, was that um, the shared parameters tended to be accurately inferred using our homogeneously mixed model. We did see that the strength of the interaction effect of flu on RSV was a bit underestimated. <laughs> but um, it was still quite 
it was still quite substantial. It was, I think, around 0.1 instead of zero. So it's not like it was, you know, way off. And also this is a bias towards the null. It suggests that um, if we're fitting age structure data using our homogeneously mixed model, the um, parameter that we're fitting for the interaction effect here is actually less strong than the true interaction. So it's possible that the interaction is even stronger than what we found in our results. Like I said earlier, we found a um, really unexpectedly long duration of this interaction, especially for flu on RSV. And um, this is not to say that this actually is the um, mechanism here, just to say that here is one potential possible mechanism that should potentially be looked into by future work. But um, influence and RSV are not related. We don't expect there to be any adaptive immunity at play here. But there is actually a feature of the innate immune system that can also be relatively long-lived, and that's called trained immunity. And this is epigenetic reprogramming of innate immune cells such that there's an enhanced response to a secondary challenge. So you see kind of what you would expect to see um, in the case of adaptive immunity. Mm. Sorry, this thing's a bit difficult to aim. Um. Well, oh well, you can see the plot. Um, you see what you kind of see with adaptive immunity, which is that when you encounter the pathogen, then for a second time, you see a faster and a stronger response to it. And this can actually persist, has been shown to actually be able to persist up to three months to even a year after initial infection. So well in line with our estimates for the duration of this interaction. Um, <clears throat> Again, we don't really know that this is happening. Um, in mice, at least, it looks like with infection with influenza has been shown to induce trained immunity and to help block infection with streptococcus about a month later. There, haven't really, there hasn't really been evidence in humans yet showing that influenza specifically can induce such an effect and for how long it may, it may last. But this is really interesting research, I think, for the future that um, might help enlighten, um, enlighten us as to the effect that influenza could plausibly have on other pathogens in the long run, especially pathogens that aren't related to it. So a few limitations I want to talk about. First of all, um, this method worked pretty well in the specific population we were trying it in here. But mm -hmm. it's possible that it's likely, in fact, that the effectiveness of these methods are going to depend on the circulation patterns of influenza and RSV. So again, you can imagine in a situation where there's not much overlap between RSV and influenza, it may be really difficult to fit the interaction effect accurately. And that's not to say that there isn't an interaction. It's just to say that the data don't necessarily contain much information on that interaction. On a somewhat related note, so far we've only fit this in a single location, Hong Kong. Um, with more locations, it'd be possible to maybe get more precise estimates of the parameters and also to do a bit more analysis of what the population level impacts of this interaction are going to be. Like I said, those are going to depend on the um, circulation patterns of both viruses and the population. We do actually have data from Canada and we're looking to get data from the US. So hopefully we will have results from a few other um, locations soon. <clears throat> and then finally, as is true of all modeling work, just because a model fits the data well doesn't necessarily mean that these results are definitely true. It would be really great to, if um, future work could confirm these with some sort of experimental work or with other study designs as well. Like I said, we're really encouraged by the high quality of our model fit, by the precision of our um, parameter estimates. Um, that seems to suggest that... Um, that seems to suggest that there are no major issues here, but it's just something to always be aware of when we're looking at modeling results, I think. So the conclusions of this part of the work are, first of all, that we found evidence of a strong negative and bidirectional interaction between influenza and RSV. <clears throat> Such an infection with either virus tends to almost completely block infection with the other. This lasted for about three months for the case of flu on RSV and one month in the other direction. And we also saw that individual level interaction may substantially impact population level dynamics. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to get a drink of water and then we can move on to objective two. So the second objective here is to, like I said earlier, to explore the impact of live attenuated influenza vaccines on RSV burden. And just to remind everyone of the context here, um, it's that a live vaccine by containing a live virus may be able to have the same impact on RSV 
as natural infection with influenza, but at the same time by blocking influenza transmission, which itself can block RSV transmission, vaccination may also lead to increase an increase in RSV burden. And we want to see which of those effects tends to dominate and when. <laughs> So we look at this by first expanding our model to account for vaccination against influenza. So here, individuals who are susceptible against either virus are able to be vaccinated. Um, the vaccine protects against is assumed to protect against influenza for the duration of the season, although it is what we call a leaky vaccine, which is to say that people who are vaccinated can still get influenza. It's just at a much lower rate. Then we assume that the efficacy and duration of the effect of the vaccine on RSV are either the same as those parameter values that we fit for natural infections, so that it's pretty much entirely blocking transmission of RSV for a duration of about three months. We also tried a sensitivity analysis where, the effect, where it only reduced transmission by 50% instead of by almost 100%, as well as a few other sensitivity analyses I'm looking at the duration, but I'm not really going to talk about those too much here. Um, because the results were fairly consistent with our main analysis. <clears throat> then what we do is for each season, we simulate the total number of influenza and RSV cases at a range of vaccine timings and vaccine coverage levels. And we calculate the effect of this live attenuated vaccine as a rate ratio, where the numerator here is the attack rate of RSV in a population where we have vaccinated at, again, some timing and some coverage level. And the denom denominator is um, the attack rate of RSV in a population where there is no vaccination. So when this is um, below one, it's suggesting that vaccine was able to reduce the burden of RSV. And when it's above one, it suggests that vaccination increased the burden of RSV. Now, um, if you remember earlier when we looked at the data in Hong Kong, what we saw was that influenza was consistently peaking around the same time as or before RSV. But in many temperate regions of the world, we actually um, see RSV peaking several weeks before influenza. And in this scenario, we might actually expect um, the LAIV to be much more effective against RSV because, again, um, by the time the influenza outbreak rolls around and is being suppressed by this vaccine, RSV has pretty much already run its course. Um, <clears throat> so for this reason, what we wanted to do was model two scenarios. In the subtropical scenario, we simply generated outbreaks using the values of the parameters that we fit at the maximum likelihood estimate. And for the temperate um, scenario, we generated outbreaks by choosing values of the season-specific parameters such that the outbreak patterns mirrored what we tend to see in temperate regions, specifically France. So here are some results for one of the seasons from our quote-unquote temperate scenario. You can see um, the solid lines over here, green is, green is influenza, purple is RSV. Those are the outbreaks in the absence of vaccination. And over on the left, what you can see is um, for different timings of vaccination on the x-axis and vaccine coverage levels on the y-axis, you can see what the impact on the attack rate of RSV was. So blue is showing the attack rate was reduced, red is showing it was increased. And what we see is that for most coverage levels and for most vaccine timings, we do actually see a reduction in RSV burden. Um, the maximum reduction was achieved, that's that circle up here, um, with very early and very high coverage vaccination. Over here, you can sort of see what happened to the RSV outbreak in that scenario. However, we do um, see that there are some situations in which there actually is a small increase in RSV burn, and those tend to happen with very early vaccination at sort of low to mid range, 30 to 40% coverage levels. And the triangle is showing then the area where there was maximum increase of the RSV outbreak. And you can all see um, what happened in that outbreak in this plot here marked by the triangle. And this is a pattern that was pretty consistent among seasons where either we saw RSV peaking several weeks before flu, or where we saw RSV attack rates being <clears throat> very high and flu attack rates being very low. In contrast, what we saw when we, um, when we looked at this more typical subtropical pattern where outbreaks were peaking around the same time or where flu was preceding RSV, uh -huh. <clears throat> what we saw was that any, um, any early vaccination tended to increase the burden of RSV. And again, the maximum increase is shown by this triangle here.
and you can see what was happening in that outbreak over here. Again, the solid lines are what happens without vaccination. The dotted lines are what happens with vaccination here. That's vaccination at the beginning of the outbreak at about a 70% coverage level. We see that we don't really see scenarios where RSV burden is reduced unless we significantly delay the vaccination until later in the season. So the maximum reduction is here, again, shown by the circle. And that's vaccination occurring, it looks like, around week 20. So in order to achieve that result, we're actually having to wait until both outbreaks have already peaked in order to start our vaccination. <clears throat> um, I want to emphasize that this is not me saying don't vaccinate against flu. This is me saying um, that it's important to be aware of what these trade-offs may be. We, of course, want to vaccinate against flu. Like I said, the populations that are affected by RSV most strongly are also affected by flu very strongly. It wouldn't make any sense to not vaccinate them against flu just to avoid RSV. However, if we know that um, a high coverage level of flu vaccination may lead to a rebound outbreak of RSV, that's something we should just be aware of so that we make sure that we have enough resources ready to deal with influxes in, um, in severe cases or in hospitalizations. <clears throat> Another thing I want to point out is that while I have labeled these for now as temperate and subtropical, um, the pattern you see on the top was not universal to temperate regions, and the pattern you see on the bottom was not universal to subtropical regions. So there were plenty of, there were outbreaks in the temperate regions where um, <clears throat> outbreaks occurred more at the same time, and there are outbreaks in Hong Kong where, like I said, attack rates of RSU were quite high and attack rates of influenza were much lower, and we saw something more, and we saw a pattern more like what we saw on the top. Um, so in other words, this is saying that, um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we can draw a sort of broad conclusion where we say, in France, this is going to be typically beneficial, and in Hong Kong, this is going to be typically detrimental. It really does depend on the season and on the circulation patterns of both viruses in that season. Um, for this reason, it kind of seems like it might be necessary for public health and medical practitioners to sort of watch how each season is going. Um, what are the circulation patterns of flu, of RSV? What is the rate at which people are getting vaccinated? And then maybe reevaluating sort of as each week, as each month goes by, what is likely of the, what is the likely impact of this on RSV? So it's unfortunately a bit more complicated than we'd like. It would be lovely to say, yes, this is a great policy in some regions and a less great pol policy in other regions. But unfortunately, it does seem to be very complicated. <clears throat> A key limitation here is that there is not any empirical evidence to date on the impact of, on the exact impact of this vaccine on susceptibility to RSV in humans. There was a study in mice showing that LAIV was able to reduce susceptibility to RSV, and there's been studies in humans showing that LAIV can influence the innate immune system, but no studies on specifically what happens to RSV then. And for that reason, we've based this analysis on a lot of assumptions. Like I said, we're assuming that vaccination with this live vaccine is having the same effect or a 50% or is having a 50% decrease in susceptibility um, against RSV, or that it's having the same effect as natural infection of influenza. Um, I don't think this means that, um, I think the qualitative results we found, so um, let me go back a bit, these patterns we've seen where we see that in general, when there's you know, this type of circulation pattern on the top, we see this type of general pattern in the effect on RSV. And when there's this type of circulation pattern, we see something more like this. Those qualitative results, I think, are um, fairly sound. Um, and we did see them across various sensitivity analyses we did on the effect of LAIV on RSV. However, if, we're re if we really want to get more solid quantitative estimates I think more work on the exact impact of this vaccine on RSV susceptibility in humans is going to be necessary first. So the key conclusion of this work is really that the impact of this vaccine on RSV burden is going to be highly dependent on the underlying circulation patterns of both viruses. And it's difficult to really draw um, super general conclusions about it. I also wanted to talk through a couple of broad conclusions of the whole project, so not just this part two, but um, part one as well. <clears throat>
And the first is, like I said earlier, that mathematical models are a really promising tool for characterizing these interactions. Like I said, despite the fact that we had a limited amount of data, limited quality of data, and we're fitting several parameters, we were still able to fit the model to the data very closely, and we were still able to get precise estimates of our parameters of interest, which suggests that this is, in fact, a really good tool for this type of project. And especially because this is an area where a lot of our standard epidemiological methods tend to fail, um, this is particularly good to see. I also just wanted to highlight the um, importance for future work to continue to try to take into account interactions. So interactions don't seem to have been studied all that much yet, but more and more evidence is, is suggesting that they're likely to be very, very common. So um, Influenza doesn't just seem to interact with RSV, it also interacts with rhinovirus and pneumococcus and potentially COVID. Um, and obviously it's incredibly difficult to take all of those interactions into account in a single study, and I wouldn't necessarily suggest doing that, but it is important that more work moving forward be at least aware of these interactions and try to take them into account when possible. Because first of all, as we've seen, when these interactions are in play, the impact of certain public health control measures may be quite different and in fact even in the opposite direction of what we of what we expect um <clears throat> which is which would be very nice to know ahead of time um especially because i do think a lot of the public is a bit skeptical about modeling work so it would be good to be able to um make predictions that um you know don't turn out to be where we're not turning out to predict that something is going to be very beneficial and then it actually turns out to be harmful um, but also just in general, if there's an interaction in play, there's really no way to get a full picture of what's going on by studying an individual pathogen in isolation. So that's all I have for you today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you have at this point. <laughs>